Hi folks, hope you're okay today. Uh, it's good to be with you. Um, on my channel, uh, I have a video uh, called Does Jesus Save Debate, which is about the resurrection by Phil Fernandez and Robert M. Price. And I listened to the debate. Now, I, I absolutely love uh, Dr. Phil Fernandez. I think he's an excellent debater. But I think he struggled in the debate to hold his own uh, with Robert M. Price. And uh, I've listened to Robert M. Price a few times now, and I think uh, he does very well in debates. And I want to share a few thoughts of how you can win a debate with him if you actually debate him as an apologist and why people are not doing well in debates against him. Um, first of all, um, Dr. Phil Fernandez used the argument of um, scholars, uh, the majority of scholars, hold to certain facts about Jesus. Um, he does give specifics of why he thinks Jesus is the Son of God. Um, about the titles, etc. Um, but in response, uh, Dr. Price gave a, a massive, uh, detailed information about the Gospels and about Paul's epistles, which um, Phil Fernandez didn't unpack and didn't challenge it vigorously enough, apart from when he mentioned Richard Balcom, but even there, there was no detail in what he was saying. So it left the audience who were listening in thinking that Phil, Dr. Fernandez didn't deal with the detail. And like I said, I'm a, I'm a fan of uh, Phil Fernandez. I think he's awesome. Uh, but I think um, Dr. Robert M. Price is doing well in his debates because um, he's able to utilize certain skills uh, that undermine his opponents and I want to share with you those skills and and how to undermine him in a debate. First of all, um, in a debate he'll, he'll talk about methodology and he'll accuse uh, the Christian of being an inerrantist and that is influencing uh, their interpretation. Uh, you need to hit that head off. Uh, you need to really make it clear you, you need in a debate you need to put Dr. Price's scholarship in the historical flow of New Testament studies and you need to educate the public and show the public where he's getting his ideas from and show that these people where he's getting his ideas are from so he's getting them from Harnack he's getting them from liberal scholars of the 19th century and show how they had bias show how they had methodologies that have been abandoned and show that his own methodology is completely biased and you've got to you've got to really hit all his methodology and if you if you hit his methodology and you hit it hard you begin to lose the debate so first so you need to show that his his his, his methodology is biased and the way you do do that is look at put him in the historical flow of New Testament studies and show people where he actually is on the scale of the historical flow and why there are certain scholars uh, in the 19th century uh, people have abandoned those ideas because of the bias in their methodology. Secondly, um, his quotations. Look at Dr. Price's quotations. And you'll find that when he's quoting ancient sources, he's not quoting them correctly. He's quoting them with a false way of reading them. He's, he's taking uh, certain hermeneutical methods um, that are actually not looking at the text, ancient text, in their context. So call him out. So call him out on his method of interpretation. Call him out on his quotations. Show expose that he's not doing these quotations correctly when he's qu quoting uh, Greek or Egyptian sources, he's not accurate in his quotations. So you can undermine his scholarship in a debate by saying, Well, you quoted this 
and it's not accurate you quoted that it's not accurate so how can I trust your scholarship when you're quoting these ancient sources um, again on his methodology uh, dates of the Gospels dates of Paul's epistles uh, pin the dates down ask him why he takes the, the view of the dates and then give your solid evidence for the dates of the Gospels this is very important uh, you've got to really hit him hard on that because his, his, his quotation of the New Testament is coming from he thinks that the New Testament is hundred and past hundred AD uh, written and all his ideas of, and all his quotations from the New Testament are coming from that theory of, of authorship so you need to make that clear and you need to say every time he's quoting the Bible every time he's quoting the New Testament he's coming from his theory that the Gospels were at a certain point were written at a certain date so undermine that show that that is a, a biased way of looking at it that there is an agenda there there are political social ideas that that Dr. Price has uh, about how the church operated to get him to the point where he believes the Gospels are a late date or the New Testament is a late date so you need to undermine all this stuff you need to really unpack it and undermine it so by the time he starts quoting his detailed stuff on the New Testament people are already beginning to be suspect about his methodology and you've got to hit him hard now he'll come back at you and he'll say to you well uh, this guy's an inheritance that's why but what you can do you can say well I hold my hand up I'm an inheritance but I'm not going to play an inheritance game I'm just going to use the methodologies the sources that critical scholars use and just stick to that so we can talk about presuppositions and presuppositions are important but I'm putting my presuppositions to the side at the moment and I'm just going to use critical scholars and their methodologies and, and, and that way his attack on you believing in inerrancy is muted so you just say I'm using critical sources I'm using this scholar that scholar I'm using the general way scholars are, are having historical criteria and you just blow him out of the water and you've got to emphasize that you're using the critical scholarship and, and you're putting your inerrancy uh, aside just for, the, just for the sake of argument so his argument will not wash um, genre um, the whole when he's throwing out quotations about the New Testament it's based on his idea of genre that the New Testament uh, is just full of midrash uh, the gospels are full of mid midrash well if you read midrash you've got to see that comparing the gospel with midrash the two different things the midrash are little pithy sayings and uh, the gospels are a, a, a continual story and that's another area where you can uh, take him apart is on the genre uh, and this is two important areas genre in the sense that you know say that the gospels are, are historical material and give historical evidences of that and literary evidences so uh, Richard Balcom in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses shows you that the gospels are historical criteria uh, uh, are are being done in a uh, as a historical method um, so you know ancient literature in the first century on his which uh, purports to be historical the gospels are mirroring that so you know make it clear what the genre of the literature is that gives you an opportunity to give you evidence that, of the historical veracity of the gospels and then demolish him on his genre by showing that his idea that it's midrash is completely bogus and say well I've read all the Mishra, M Mishnah and it's just not the same as the four gospels he's incorrect so in other words you've got to know the kind of genre that he thinks the literature is you've got to know the literature of these genres the midrash and master that and then when he goes on to this stuff you've got to then you can then reply to him and say no I've read the mission uh, the missionary and it's not nothing to do with the gospels not the same so you've got a ma you've always got to master what these people have read what these people are thinking what these people are going to quote 
and you've got to be able to say I've read that it doesn't make sense you, you're incorrect all right because what these scholars do like this they will use uh, literature like the Mishnah and other literature ancient literature that nobody else has read or few people have read in the public and, and then when people hear them they get disturbed and confused because they've not read this stuff and they get undermined but if they can see another scholar who says well I've read all that stuff it's just nonsense what you're saying it puts people at ease so you've got to master the stuff that he's read and that he's going to quote to you and then you can quote it back at him and say I've read it, it doesn't make sense alright and you've got to know because what they'll do is they'll pull out literature ancient literature it might be an ancient novel or something and start quoting it and because nobody else has read it people just accept it as an argument and even apologies do and you've got to say well I've read the novel I've read the ancient novels in the first century and you're incorrect you've, I've read the Mishnah you're incorrect I've read the Dead Sea Scrolls you're incorrect you've got to know all the sources that he's going to use and say no you're incorrect all right you've got to do that and that, you, you're not doing that enough you're not doing that um, the same with Richard Carey it gets away he makes powerful arguments because nobody's pulling him up on his bad quotation of ancient sources and the fact that um, the, the opposing apologist is not saying well I've read that you're incorrect you know like the song of Isaiah um, so genre is important um, the important thing is there is these kind of scholars what they're trying to do is bog people down with detail the way the ancient apologists the way Athanasius and all the great ancient first century apologists dealt with these with scholars of their time who were doing this kind of stuff is they got they, they went to the big picture yeah if you get a broad picture of of a book if your opponent is hitting you with detail but you can give the the broad outline of the book or the broad outline of the New Testament that is a powerful argument because it undermines the specifics that the individual is trying to throw at you so when he's quoting when Dr. Price is quoting bits from Mark and bits from John if you say well what do you think Dr. Price is the outline of Mark and he'll say well it's just a, a mismatch it doesn't make sense and of anything it's just midrash here midrash there whatever you know contradictions here contradictions there and then there that, that's your opportunity to say well actually if you look right through the Gospel of Mark there is a theme of XYZ and by doing that you completely undermine everything that he said because you've given people the broad outline of the book so genre you gotta hit him hard on genre yeah you gotta know the genre you gotta know the mission you gotta know these ancient novels and you gotta be able to say why the gospels are not the same as these genres yeah you gotta show that his quotations of these things are incorrect and then you've gotta show when he hits you on the details of the New Testament you give the broad outline of a book get to the high ground of the overall picture in every debate with him in every book that he quotes that will undermine him big time in, in your debates with him and then uh, detail you need to make sure that you you do you go over and over the Gospels over over the New Testament epistles when you're in debate with him go before you get to debate him go over the Gospels if you go to third millennium or you go over at where, uh, where they do lectures on the Gospels but you need to go over and over and over the Gospels so when he does throw out detail you can answer that detail you can say well yeah you're saying that but here's the detail and, and take him on his own ground and undermine him when he starts getting into the detail uh, it, that's going to be very difficult because he's a master at getting to the detail and confusing people but you've got to work hard and do the research and do the reading and do the thinking so when he brings up the detail you can undermine him quickly snappily 
with a few factual bits about the Gospels here there now if you do that you will push this guy back and you will undermine him in debate and you will win the debate um, that is the way to beat him that is the way to beat him in a debate win a debate you can't go in there with an argument that says we have the majority scholars on our side here's a few simple arguments uh, about the resurrection with Dr. Price because he'll undermine that very quickly by throwing questions about uh, the genre of the literature that is Midrash throwing questions out in very detailed analysis of the Gospels and people are just going to hear that and they're just going to get really bogged down and confused what you've got to do is you've got to do a systematic very clear solid critique of his work in the debate and that means you've got to hit him hard on his methodology and you've got to hit him hard on the detail and you've got to hit him really really hard and if you don't do that you're gonna you're not gonna do well with him uh, in the debate okay those are my thoughts that that's my my thought uh, in debating Dr. Price if I was debating him uh, I would um, I would I would absolutely I would spend a quarter of my time on his methodology and I would pick holes in his quotations I know for a fact that his quotations of ancient sources are not accurate so I would pick him apart on his methodology I would I would uh, show how he's inaccurate in his quotations he's inaccurate in understanding ancient literature and, and just absolutely demolish his scholarship generally then I would set my case out and then deal with after that I would deal with the specifics that he brings up by showing the overall outline of each book that he's quoting and how when he's quoting the text he's quoting things out of context then um, when he starts to debate and he throws up the inerrancy issue I would have already I'd have already demolished him on his methodology and I would have just said hey I'm an inerrantist but I'm just using critical methods I'm not I'm not following the inerrancy's path in this position I'm just working as a historian I'm not working as a theologian here um, then when he starts hitting you with detail you can match him on that detail you can say well you're quoting this you're quoting that you're quoting it out of context here's why xyz and don't get bogged down with him too much on detail when you've answered some of his detail push him back you know don't get don't play his game don't get too bogged down in the detail but make make sure you answer enough of the detail so that people know that you're actually dealing with what he's saying but once you've done the detail enough with him and you played his game just for a little bit then you need to throw him back on the ropes and land some intellectual punches when you've done that what you do then is you push him back onto the ropes right? when you've answered his detail don't do too much because that's what he want and that will confuse people then get back to the broad big broad clear arguments that undermine what he's saying and that people can follow okay and hit, keep hitting him with hard questions ask him really tough questions that when people hear it clearly undermines what he's, he's saying for example you say, you, you can say to him uh, you quoted that text there yeah um, but that's under the basis that you're using kind of like a, a Boltman uh, frame of reference so could you explain to me your theory of community and how communities uh, edit text and how, how that is impacting your interpretation of that text could you just explain to me so he'll, he'll say whatever and then you, you push him again what you're doing you're exposing his hermeneutical method as being totally biased that it's not as accurate as he's making out to be so you've got to push tough questions at him like that 
And so when the audience are listening, they're saying, well, actually, he's not actually quoting these texts in a fair way. He's actually got these theories of community, theories of, of authorship, theories of uh, genre that are actually just permeating everything he's saying. And this guy, this other apologist, he's answered detail, so I know that he's faithful in dealing with the detail, but actually this is a red herring. The Christian apologist is right. The Christian apologist is dealing with the detail, he's not get, he's not hiding away from that. But, he's, he, he's clearly shown that this is a rabbit trail, because this guy on the other side is just full of his different theories of how to interpret that are influencing his interpretation. That's how I would undermine this guy, and uh, I, I think I do a lot. Of, I, I do a, a better job than than some of you apologists out there in, in debating him. I, I don't mean that in an offence, but um, as an offence. But this guy needs special. You need to be a specialist in in taking this guy out, and it's no good just reading his literature and making notes you've got to know what you're looking for you've got to know what you're looking for what you're looking for is how he's using his sources go and see how he's using his sources and I'm telling you the guy is not using his sources correctly his, his methodology in using his sources is really really horrendously bad from a historical point of view and um, what you need to do is uncover that and then present your evidence to the audience and when you do that this guy will be blown out of the water and you're not doing that uh, I've seen it James White debate him I've seen uh, it that was a very very good debate excellent debate but James White still didn't take him out uh, I've seen Phil Fernandez debate him and Wheeler and Craig and all three have not taken this guy out fully You've not demolished this guy. If you're going to debate someone, you need to make sure that you've demolished them. You've you've actually left no stone unturned that the guy can't stand after you've finished. And you're not doing that. And you're not doing that because I, su I suspect that you you're being too kind. You, because he's got some kind of reputation. It doesn't matter. Bad scholarship is bad scholarship, and it needs to be called out as bad scholarship. And that, it's as simple as that. And um, you're not doing that. You're not doing that as as uh, as strongly as you need to. Um, William Wayne Craig came back back at him in debate and uh, pointed out his methodological problems that Dr. Price has. He did it, but he didn't do it enough. You need to push more. The same with Phil Fernandez. You didn't. You got to The the things that I've said. Those are the areas that you should have covered. Um. On Pauline scholarship. Um. You know. Again, the same way to deal with him. Those principles that I've just said. Uh, the way to defend Pauline scholarship, which he he seems to try and undermine. Um, so that that's what I think anyway. Uh, these this kind of scholar is a dime a dozen. When you read the history of theology, when you read the history of New Testament scholarship, these kind of scholars are a dime a dozen. They're easy to demolish. So a Fernandez, a James White, and a William Lane Craig should have no problem in dealing with a person like this. Because if you know anything about the history of New Testament studies, these kind of scholars are a dime a dozen. And so you should be able to deal with the guy. And uh, that's my advice. My advice is, I've given my advice, you need to take that advice because Christian apologists are not doing well against this guy. Uh, he's a shrewd operator and I've given you some ideas and thoughts how to uh, undermine this guy in debate and show that this guy is not telling the truth, he's not tell he's not giving the right, he's not saying the what is true to to the facts. And you've got you've got to be much more vigorous and much more 
intellectually ruthless in undermining this guy's methodology and sources that's what you've got to do when I mean ruthless I mean you've got to go right through his work check all his sources and you'll find a massive list of stuff where he's not quoted his stuff correctly where he's, he's, it's subjective uh, interpretation where it's bad understanding of the genre of the literature that he's quoting go right through it, collect a mass of stuff, put it in a succinct formula that you can think and then present it to the public that's ruthless because that undermines his whole career, it undermines his whole scholarship but it has to be done to show that what he's saying is not true he does it, he'll do it to you Richard Carrier will do it to you, they will, they are ruthless, they will clearly any argument they can get hold of, any facts that they can get to undermine your position, they'll do it so you've got to be the same ruthless, not ruthless as in unkind, we're, we're to be loving and gracious but ruthless in scholarship, in being thorough and get, the, get to the nitty gritty of what it's all about and then present what you're saying in a succinct way and demolish the person That that's what I think. I think uh, it's too much, too much playing around. Too much, uh, too much saying. The majority of scholars say this. The majority of scholars say that. That's that's not going to that's not going to carry the day with someone like uh, Dr. Robert M. Price. This guy is a very clever, shrewd operator of a debater. So if you're going to win in debate with this guy, you've got to raise your game. I know I would if I debated him. I know he wouldn't. If I debated him, he wouldn't win me in debate. Um, because I would know every area of where he would go. I would know every area of what he was going to quote, what he was going to say, <coughs> and I'd know all the weaknesses of of everything he's saying and all his strengths and I would undermine everything that he was saying and that's what we're not doing with this guy uh, and he's and that's why he's getting away with he's getting away with because he's been he's able to present this mess of detailed information that nobody's unpacking and I've just given you some ways to unpack it or I'm going to leave it there.